Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. kids this morning or whether you're just parents in general. So the Bible tells us that children are a blessing from God, but parenting isn't easy. Just because it's a blessing doesn't mean it's an easy blessing, right? Because there's sleepless nights and there's frustration and there's moments of complete chaos, isn't there? In your home, there was, there is in our home. But in the midst of all that, God offers you a blessing as parents because parenting is will reveal how much you need Jesus. That's what parenting does. It reveals how much you need Jesus. It reveals that you are not sufficient for the task of raising kids. And that's whether they're this size or whether they're this size. You're not sufficient for that task. But each time your inadequacy is revealed, that's an opportunity for you to turn to Jesus and ask him for help and ask him for strength. He is sufficient to raise your kids. You aren't. He is. So look to him. Call on him. Ask him for help. Now, church family, we're going to have some families with some younger kids coming up here, and and you're going to get to meet them maybe for the first time. And I want you to know that by these, these parents coming forward, what they're doing is they're coming to ask you for help. That's what they're doing is they're coming to ask you for help. And there are two practical ways you can help families with children especially families with small children. First, because parenting is hard work, sometimes these parents are going to need a break. You are here to give them a break. Ask them if you can watch their kids for them. When we're having a church fellowship and we're all down in the gym, just go grab a baby or grab the toddler from the mom so that she can visit and have some some time off. That's one way you can help, just by helping with the act of parenting. But then the second way you can help is these children need to know two things from you. As they grow up in our church, they need to know two things. First, they need to know that you love Jesus. And then secondly, they need to know that you love them. They need to know those two things. You love Jesus and you love them. That means you have to take time to invest yourself in them and get to know them as people. One of the only times that Jesus was super angry with his disciples was a time when they were treating children as if they didn't matter. Because children do matter. And they're people, and you need to get to know these people. And so what that means for you as a church family, sign up to be on the nursery rotation. Each week during this time right here, we, members of our church are down there serving, playing with kids, teaching them about Jesus and his love for them. Sign up to be on that list. Whenever it comes time and you see we're taking kids to camp, guess what? Sign up to go take kids to camp. When we need grow group leaders for our children's Sunday school classes, sign up to do that. That's that's the other way that you as a church family can help these parents raise their kids to love Jesus. All right, so I'm going to invite these parents forward as I call them. You just stay in your seat until I call you. So first I'm going to invite John and Justine Brown. And they're bringing Sterling Christopher And Sterling was born last year on May 19th, so he's almost a year old now. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Sterling always has a smile for you. You got one today? Yeah, of course you do. Now, his first name, he was named after the Battle of the Sterling Bridge. I don't know anything about that. I'll have to ask you about that sometime. And then Christopher after his grandfather. And... John and Justine, I'm going to give this to you, and then I'm going to give, this Bible is for Sterling, 
If he wants to cut his teeth on it, he's welcome to because it's his Bible. And then here's a Jesus storybook Bible for y'all to read together as a family. All right, next I'm going to invite the Howls. And they're bringing... Oh, you stay right there. That's cool. I'll walk over here. So the Howls are bringing Amelia Lynn. And we are so glad that she is here with us in church. And she's not on oxygen anymore. Praise God. And we will be praying for her in the coming days because she's still got some things ahead of her. And Amelia Lynn just adds to the, the wonderful chaos of your home, right? Chaos is right. Yeah. And, and I also have things for, for y'all and for Amelia. And I didn't even say, what day was Amelia born? April, April 7th. We're so glad that she's here. And then I'm going to invite um, our newest members of our church, Justin and Jessica. They're going to bring their boys up, all three of their boys. You're going to meet Truett and Porter and Connor. Connor, Truett, and Porter. So Porter's the newest. He was born January 16th of this year. No, oh. 21. Yeah, he looks a little <laughs> looks a little big to be born this year. And then True is born November 17th. 2018. Connor, how old are you? Seven. You're seven. All right, well, Connor, because you're seven, I'm gonna give you this to take home for your for your family. You could even read that to your brothers, couldn't you? And then for each of these little guys, here's a Bible for them, and then I have this certificate for y'all. Now, what I'm going to invite, y'all just stay right here. If you are family or friends of these couples up here, or your Sunday school class or something, will you come up and stand around them and let's surround them as I pray, as we pray together for them this morning? If you know multiple ones, you just have to choose one. That's all you got to do. <laughs> all right, let's, let's pray together. And if you're close to them, would you just put, put your hand on their shoulder or on the baby's shoulder, and let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for these children, and we want to thank you for these families. First off, God, we want to ask that these parents, would you would enable them to lead their children to know their need for you that they would lead their children to grow up loving you, loving your word, loving your people. Secondly, Father, we want to ask that as these children grow, that they would learn to love Jesus and they would trust Jesus. Each of them would trust Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior. And that then you would give them a love for people who don't know Jesus yet, that they might go out and share your good news. And then third, Father, I want to pray for our church family, that you would help us as a church support these families and these children well. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name because he's able to make it all happen. Amen. Amen. You may be, all be seated. Well, I said they could be seated. I want everybody to stand up. Because now we're going to take a little bit of time to greet. The one announcement I have for you is don't come back here tonight. If, if you come back here tonight, you'll be locked out of the building. Spend time with your mothers. Something like that this evening would be great. Take some time to visit the people around you. Tell them you're glad to see them.
As you make your way back to your seats, will you continue to sing with us? Let's continue to lift up Jesus, the name in which there is, there is hope. The name that Peter said, under heaven and earth, no other name has been found to give salvation than Jesus. Will you sing with us? There is no other. There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When our castles crumble. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock I will stand. We sing glory. Glory, glory. We have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem. Our loudest praises ring. We crown him Lord of all. Sing together your kindly rule. of sin's tyranny and my life is hidden neath heaven's shadow your crimson flood covers me and your crimson flood covers me Glory, glory, we have no other King but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown Him Lord. we pray and make our hearts believe in every sorrow in all my sorrows Jesus is better make my heart believe in every victory Jesus is better Jesus is better, make my heart believe, more than all riches, Jesus is better, make my heart believe, oh we declare it together, our souls declare Jesus is better, make my heart believe. Glory, glory, we have no other King but Jesus, Lord of all. Sing that again, sing glory, glory.
Amen. As we sing this, and as I'm thinking about where we're going, we get to spend some time today, not to spoil it, but thinking about our relations as parents and children. And it's so sweet to sing that song and to realize that, that we are children of God. And so uh, we get to relate to him as a child to a father. He is this unapproachable king. He is this sovereign and, and transcendent God. And yet he makes a way for us to come to him like sons and daughters. And that is good news. Y'all can have a seat. And uh, this time I'd like to invite our ushers forward as we prepare uh, to continue in worship through giving. And as they come forward, uh, let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, that as far as we are from you, as far as we are beneath you, in our just being created, God, we, we are, you should be unapproachable to us, and yet you have made a way, a very costly way, at the very cost of your life, Jesus, you've made a way for us to be welcomed into the home, uh, to have a place in front of you and in your presence, and Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you, as your church comes together to, to worship you and honor you, uh, through giving, I pray that you would take this and first and foremost be doing a work in our hearts. God, let us see that what we have comes from you and what we have is not ours, but it is yours. And Lord, from there, I pray that you would bless our community. God, may hungry people be fed, may people in need be given what they need, and above all, may the gospel go forth in Weatherford. And beyond that, Lord, I pray for this global, global reach. Lord, that your gospel would go, would not be stopped at borders or security checkpoints or anywhere, but it would go out into the whole world, that everyone could see and behold you and give you the praise you deserve. In Christ's name, amen. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscience, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. And what rain of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, 
new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Jesus, we thank you that we cannot out your grace or out your mercy. And I pray that as we turn to your word, that your grace and mercy would be apparent to us, God. That you speak to us, that you lay out a path of salvation, a path of righteousness by which we can follow after you is in itself grace and mercy. And so as we turn to your word, I'm asking your word and your spirit to be at work in this room. In Christ's name, amen. to you if you're a mother. If you're not a mother, I guess not a happy Mother's Day to you, all right? Can you say that to somebody that's not a mother? Is that legitimate? We have disagreement in, in the room. <laughs> all right, y'all can talk amongst yourselves later if you want to figure that out. I wanted to tell you about something I'm excited about this summer, and this is just a preview. You don't get to get it this week. But this summer, this is a, a bingo scorecard. This summer, we are going to play church family summer bingo. We're going to play church family summer bingo. And there are some great prizes to go along with church family summer bingo. One thing that I find out from time to time when I'm visiting with you, I'll be talking over to somebody on this side and I'll say, oh, you know so-and-so, referring to somebody over here, and they don't know them. And that happens to me all the time. And, and I... I just realized that while I know all of you, you don't all know all of you. And we're a family. We should know all of each other as much as, much as is possible. And so this summer, we're going to make a concerted effort for that. At, for families to spend time with other families in our church that they don't really normally hang out with. And there's going to be prizes to get you excited about it. And to get your kids excited about prompting you. Because I figure if your kids get excited about it, then you'll end up doing it. So that's our goal. And, and you'll, you'll learn more about Emmanuel Summer Family Bingo next, next week or two. Now we're spending three weeks considering from the book of Colossians what God says about relationships and Christian households. And today I'm going to invite Karina to come read our scripture passage for us. So if you'll turn to Colossians 3 and stand with me in honor of God's word and follow along as she reads. Colossians 3, 21, and Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, do not stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for these words, how the gospel transforms parent-child relationships. And I ask today that you would use your word to call us to repentance where we fall short, but then also to grant us faith in your good news as the hope for change. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Please be seated. If you remember back to high school or maybe to college, inevitably there are classes 
that you can't take until you take other classes, right? There's a prerequisites to take that class. So for instance, you want to take Spanish 3? You can't take Spanish 3 unless you've had Spanish 2. I want you to know that the passages of Scripture Karina just read to us, that there is a prerequisite for you to be able to live this out. And the prerequisite is that you have to be born again. You have to be spiritually born again. Now, if you're not born again, if you don't know Jesus, you can attempt to obey the things that you just heard, but your motivation to obey them will become corrupted. For instance, if if you're an unbelieving child, you will inevitably start trying to obey your parents just to get their approval. So you're working for the approval of man. If you're an unbelieving parent, you will train your kids in hopes that they grow up and their success makes you look good. You make an idol out of your children as they grow up. Only born-again people, people who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, can apply these words and find the blessings that God intends in them. Because notice, they were all qualified. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. In the Lord. Fathers and mothers, train up your children in the instruction of the Lord. This tells us that in Christian households, there is mutual responsibility. Relation, mutual responsibility both ways, from children to parents and from parents to children. When the Apostle Paul wrote these words in the ancient Roman Empire, children had very little value. Children had very little value. We have letters from Romans, from Roman citizens, not Christians, Roman citizens throughout the Roman Empire and, and there, we have this one letter in particular where the guy, the, the father, the husband was out on a business trip and his wife was pregnant. And in the letter, he wrote to his wife, if it's a girl, put it out with the trash. If it's a boy, then that's good and we'll keep it. Like that was common practice in the Roman Empire. They would, depending on if the child was convenient, depending on if it was the right gender, whether they wanted to keep it or not. They saw children as disposable, which is not unlike the practice of abortion in our day. Many people in our day see children as disposable. But that's not what God says about children. And the Christians, part of the reason that Christianity took off in the Roman Empire was because Christians also honored children. They began to rescue the babies from the trash heaps and raise them as their own. Jesus showed us repeatedly during his ministry that he values children. As God's people, whether you're an adult, a parent, or a child, we must learn to respect and value one another. Parents, we need to learn to see God's image in our children. And children, you need to learn to see God's image in your parents. And these verses show us how to do that. So let's look at the two commands. First, the command for kids, and then one for parents. So if you're a kid... Will you come up here and join me and just come sit right here on the front floor in front of me right here? Thank you, Bobby. You're the first one. All right, so the verse, I don't know if you, if you heard Miss Karina just read this verse, and it said this. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you a question about the verse. It says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. In everything, obey your parents. So what if your parent tells you it's time for bed? Do you have to obey them for that? Yeah, yeah that's you part of obeying your parents. What if, what if they ask you to do something you don't like, like eat vegetables? Do you have to obey your parents if they say eat vegetables? Yes. Yeah, that's part of obeying God in everything. What if, what if your dad comes in and says, I want you to stop playing a video game and go clean your room? Do you have to obey him in that? Yeah, because God says, obey your parents in everything. And the reason is, he says, do it because it makes God happy. It pleases God. Now, there's two parts. I can't see you there, Bobby. There are two parts to obeying. First, you got to listen, and then you can do what they say, right? Because if you don't listen, you don't know what they said. Do any of you ever have trouble hearing what your mom and dad say? Yes. Do your parents ever say, I told you five times, and, and that was the first time you're hearing about it. Does that happen to you? Yeah. You know what? I'm a grown-up, and that still happens to me when, 
when people in my family talk to me that I just don't hear them. Obedience starts, first we have to listen, and then we can do what they say. Somebody told me a long time ago, they gave me this definition of obedience. See if you think it works. Obedience is doing what you're told, when you're told, with a happy heart. Doing what your parents have told you to do, when they tell you to do it, with a happy heart. Now, does that mean that you have to be happy about doing chores? Does that mean you have to be happy about eating vegetables? No, No, you're right. It doesn't mean you have to be happy about those things. The reason you can do it with a happy heart is because you're pleasing God. And pleasing God always makes our hearts happy because he loves us. He gave us life. He gave his life for us. So we want to please him. That's why we can do it with a happy heart. Now, whenever Miss Karina read the verses, there was one verse that there was a promise to kids that if you obey, God promises you something. Did anybody hear what God promised you? He said, if you obey your parents and the Lord, it will go well with you and you will have a long life. It will go well with you and you will have a long life. God promises those things to you when you obey your parents to please God. So I have a challenge for you. Did I just lose them? Where did I put? There they are. Right in front of me. All right, I want each of you to take one of these. You take one and pass it around, Oakley. And, and it's just the verse. Here's my challenge for you while it's coming to you. I want you to memorize this verse. Now, if I'm going to memorize a verse, you know what I do? I say it out loud. Yeah, hand them out, Oakley. Yeah, just take one. There you go. Thank you. If I'm going to memorize a verse, I say it out loud five times a day. And then here's what, here's what you can do with it. When your parent asks you to clean your room or to eat your vegetables, you can say this in your mind. Children, obey your parents in everything. So here's my deal for you. If you will obey this, if you will memorize this verse, and then next time you come to church, if you'll come tell it to me, I will buy you whatever sonic drink you want. Okay? So next, it can be, you can get a Route 44 if you want. Okay? But, so you have to, you have to memorize it. You have to know what this says and come tell me without looking at it next time you come to church, whether that's next week or the week after. Okay, so the way you can memorize it, say it out loud five times, sit there and read it right now during the sermon. Memorize it. Come tell me next week or two. Children, obey your parents in in everything, for this pleases the Lord. All right, now the the other thing I need to ask of you guys is at the end of our time today, we're going to hand out flowers to all the moms. So in a little while, I'm going to ask you to come back up and help me hand out flowers in a little bit. There they are. But when I do it right now, we're going to wait. All right, so thank you. You go, go back to your seats now. Now, let me give you adults a few other thoughts about this command for children to obey their parents and everything for this pleases God. In contrast to what we talked about last week, last week we talked about the instructions to husbands and wives. Colossians 3.20 says children are commanded to obey. Verse 18 does not say wives are commanded to obey. Obedience and submission are two totally different things. Wives don't obey husbands because children are in a position of subordination to their parents. Wives are not in a position of subordination to their husbands. They are equal, equal in God's sight, and it's only as a wife chooses to submit from a place of equality, like we talked about last week, like Jesus did with God, choose to submit from a place of equality. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. Another note, and I think this applies if you're college students and teenagers especially, when Paul says, children obey your parents and everything, that he's talking about kids who live under their parents' roofs. So if you don't live in your, with your parents anymore, if you've grown up and moved out, You don't have to obey your parents anymore. You've moved to a new stage of life, which Paul reminds us in Ephesians when he says, he quotes the fifth commandment from the Old Testament, honor your father and your mother. So when you live under your parents' roof, 
you are to obey them in everything. When you move out of your parents' house, honor your father and mother. And honor your father and mother, you never outgrow that command. doesn't matter how old you get. You never outgrow the command to honor them. Now, the way that adult children honor their father and mother, I want you to know that matters to God. So if you're an adult here and your parents are still alive, the way that you treat your parents matters to God. We have an example in Mark 7 when Jesus talked about that in that day, they had come up with this loophole so that if you had money that you should be caring for your aging parents, but you don't like them and you don't want to, so they came up with a loophole. Well, you could give that money to the temple. You could give it to God and still be okay. And Jesus comes along and says, no way. No way, because you're supposed to honor your father and mother as long as they, they are alive. And actually, we as Americans, as American Christians, have a lot to learn from our brothers and sisters in Asia or our Christian brothers and sisters in Central America and how they honor and care for their parents as they age. Another thing about this, especially we find this as we're adults, as we become adults, we begin to realize that our parents didn't always do things that pleased God. And our parents didn't always make choices that pleased God. And sometimes as we become adults, we have to set boundaries with our parents or we have to explain to them why we disagree with them on an issue. But I want you to know that we can still do that with respect. We can still and we still should treat them with honor. Now, one last caveat with this. It, go, it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. If a parent asks a child to do something sinful, that child does not have to obey their parents. Because the point of obeying parents is to please God. And if you've asked a child to sin, they are no longer pleasing God. So parents on your side, none of your instructions to your children should ever lead them into sin, should ever ask them to do something that God doesn't want them to do. All right, well, let's turn our attention to the parents. So look at Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. Ephesians 6.4. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, why are we looking at a command of fathers on Mother's Day? Well, you, in the Greek, the plural word fathers, anytime the word is used in a plural way, it refers to both parents. So this isn't just fathers. This is fathers and mothers. Do not exasperate your children. Don't stir up anger in them, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, while this is a command for both parents, I do think Paul uses the word fathers intentionally to remind us guys that God holds us primarily responsible for the spiritual training of our kids. Dads, did you hear me? God holds you primarily responsible for the spiritual training of your kids. One day when you stand before God and he asks you about the spiritual training of your kids, you can't hide behind your wife. He's going to look at you and require that of you. I think for a lot of dads, we think of the place that we go to work as our primary job. It's not. It's your secondary job. The place you go when people pay you is your secondary job. Your primary job is when you come home from that other place of work. When you come home, you're clocking in to your primary God-given job. So don't come home thinking of it as a place to just unwind. Your home is a realm that God has given you to steward and to care for. These are people that God has placed under your care for you to instruct and to train. And dads, you can't do that. You can't do that well if you sit in front of the TV all day or if you play on your phone all the time. Now, there is time to rest at home. God gave you a whole day of the week to rest, and you should rest from work. He intends that, but there's also responsibility in your home. When I was a new husband and a new father, I was terrible at this. I would come home from, from work and from school and I would turn on the Xbox, and I would play for hours. And what I was doing was I was abdicating 
my God-given responsibility to instruct my family and train my kids and care for them. We aren't good at this, but God calls us to something better. And can I say, moms, thank you for picking up the slack for us. Oftentimes, when husbands and fathers abdicate, moms step in and pick up the slack on the job that God has asked of the the husband to do. And in many homes, mothers are the ones who have instructed and trained their kids to follow Jesus. So thank you, moms, for doing that. Now, dads, it's Mother's Day, so you know you should be honoring your wife if she's a mother. I do want you to know that don't do what I did. I think I've shared this with you before. My very first Mother's Day, let me tell you something else about how terrible of an early husband father I was. Our very first Mother's Day, I didn't get Carrie anything for Mother's Day. And when she asked me why, and I was not at all being ugly with this, you, you probably know what I said. You're not my mother. That did not go over well. We do things on Mother's Day every year now. Dads, do you want to know one thing you can do for your wife this Mother's Day? Is you can reclaim ownership of what God has asked of you. Take the lead in your family to instruct your children and train them up in the Lord. You can't give her a better Mother's Day present than that. Now, parents, when we look at these commands Paul gives us, the first one he says is don't exasperate your kids. Don't provoke them. Don't stir up anger in them. And there are a couple of ways we do this. Sometimes as parents, we make unreasonable demands on our kids. I find that when I'm stressed out, well, the more stressed out I am, the more likely my demands are to be unreasonable on my kids. Sometimes as a parent, all you want is quiet, right? Sometimes the bickering and the complaining from your kids is more than you can take. And so those are the times when I often come up with unreasonable demands. Like, okay, no talking for the rest of the day. Have you ever said that? No TV for the next year. Or you're grounded until you're 25. Have you ever said those kind of things to your kids, these unreasonable demands? Now, it's tricky because our kids do need correction. They need correction And they need appropriate consequences, but sometimes we're so frustrated in that moment that we can't really hand out appropriate consequences. So if you're in that state, give yourself, it's okay to take a break and step back and come back to them when you're thinking clearly again. Now, another way we embitter our children is by pointing out their faults, pointing out their faults. And I had to repent to my son this week because as I was studying this, I realized that I point out his faults way too often. I'm always having conversations with him about the things he can improve, the ways he can get better. And that's an easy trap for us to fall in as parents because we want our kids to improve, don't we? We want them to get better and, and become mature, responsible people. But if that's all we ever talk to them about, we might be burdening them. They might feel they're not good enough. We might be crushing their spirits. And I'd encourage you, if you're a parent of an older child or a teenager, you might just ask them. You might just ask them if they ever feel like they can't live up to your standards or if they ever feel like you're disappointed in them all the time. What's funny about it is, even though I was always sharing with Peyton the things that I think he could get better at, He might feel like he can't ever measure up, but I couldn't be prouder of him, right? It's just a desire that I want him to do better. So parents, have you reminded your kids lately that your love for them is not based on what they do? Have you reminded them that it's not tied to anything they accomplish? Colossians 3 encourages us to nurture our kids. Now, once again, It's complicated, parents, because our children, our teenagers need boundaries. They need boundaries. They need correction when they mess up. God expects us to provide healthy rules because children without rules, children without discipline are unhappy children, and they grow up to be unhappy adults. Parents must provide boundaries and correction. But if it helps, learn to address their behavior 
rather than their character. Okay, so if, if your son lies to you, say, you lied to me, rather than you are a liar. If they're laying around playing video games all day, learn to say, you were being lazy, instead of you are lazy. Address the behavior, affirm who they are as a person, though, and your love for them. Let's be careful not to stir up anger in them. Now, the second part of the command in Ephesians 6 that we find is raise your kids in training and instruction of the Lord. And those last words are important because there's a difference between the training and instruction of the world and the training and instruction of the Lord. If you are raising your kids exactly the same way that all the other parents are, you're not doing it right. As God's people, we're not to be like the rest of the world. He's called us to something different. We have different purpose than they do. Are you raising your kids for, your different, for that different purpose? So as a mom and a dad, you might be wondering, okay, so how do I do that? How do I raise my kids in training and instruction? Well, where do you get the training and instruction? This right here. Are you talking to your kids about God's word? Do you read Bible stories together? Do you pray about the things that are happening in your life and in their life? And there are two parts. There's training and instruction. The instruction is the content. Like there's some things they need to know about Jesus and what he's done. But then the training is the practice. How do they learn to obey Jesus? How do they learn to listen to Jesus? And if you ignore Christian training and instruction, it will lead to sorrow in your life. I can't tell you, as a, as a pastor, how many times I have had people older than me come up to me and say, I raised my kids in church, but they don't go anymore. I thought that they were following Jesus, but they don't seem to anymore. Somewhere along the way, Christians bought into the lie that taking kids to church is all you got to do. They bought into the lie that it's the church's responsibility to train and instruct my kids to follow Jesus. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't say it's the, it's the church's job to make sure your kids follow Jesus. We just read it. It's your job as parents to train and instruct your kids in the Lord. Now, when it says instruct, don't get it scared about, it's not formal instruction. You don't have to prepare a lesson and then have them sit down in a classroom setting. We've got help for you. Pastor Roger does a great job with this. Every week, he sends out an email, two different emails, one to kid, parents of elementary age-ish kids and one to parents of teenagers. And these emails are a great resource of just something easy you can have a conversation with your kids about over dinner or while you're driving in the car, just to get you and your kids having a spiritual conversation. Roger, what day of the week do you send that out? Monday morning. And so if somebody's here and they're not on that, how do they get on that list? Call the church office, give them your email, and you can get this every Monday. And it is a tool for you to have spiritual conversations with your kids. The other thing that's up here, parents, that I want you to know about is there are some resources to have more spiritual conversations. So I have four resources right here, kind of different ages for kids, for you and your family. Now, so after the service, pa parents, not kids, parents come up and look, and if there's one that looks interesting to you, you can sign it out. I have a sign-out sheet right here. You can't have it. I'm not giving it to you. But you can sign it out and use it for your family and then bring it back and you can get another one. Come do that after the service. The other thing over here, if you don't have a Jesus Storybook Bible, you need one. I would just come up and take one. These things are fantastic. They really are. And then there are a couple of books here about growing in my faith and I'm a Christian now for elementary age kids. And those are free if anybody would use them for their family. I want you to know, parents, it's not hard to train your kids to give them the instruction of God. You just got to talk to them about Jesus. That's what you're doing. You're talking to them about Jesus. And we have things to help you with here. If you need more help, you can come sit down and talk with me or Pastor Roger. We'd be glad to. And the other thing I would say 
parents who are trying to train their kids to follow Jesus, look around at people with kids who, have, kids who are older than yours. If you see somebody that has a kid older than yours that follows Jesus faithfully, you should go sit down with that parent and pick their brain. Say, how did you do this? What kind of things did you do with your kids? Learn from them. Okay, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. It may take a village to raise a child, but it takes a church to raise a Christian parent. That's what we're trying to do. Because parents, it's not enough to provide physically for your family. I think that's one of the great lies that Satan tells American Christians. He tells you, and it sounds good, work hard so you can provide the best things in life for your family. I mean, that sounds good, but he deceives you into thinking the best things in life are material things. You do need to work hard to provide the best things in life for your family, but this is the best thing, not the material stuff. If we, as parents, provide everything our kids need materially and we fail to entrain them, fail to train and instruct them in the Lord, we have failed as Christian parents. And I don't say that lightly. And I don't say that with condemnation. It's just reality. It's a sad reality. And for some of you with adult children who don't seem to walk with Jesus, you grieve daily over this. But I want you to know you don't have to give up hope. The ship hasn't sailed. But as with everything else in the Christian life, it starts with repentance. It starts with repentance in your own heart. Honestly evaluate your parenting. Look back. Did you raise them up? Did you give them God's word faithfully, consistently? Did you train them in how to follow Jesus? And if not, ask God for forgiveness in those areas. And then start praying and asking God to draw their hearts back to him. And you may even need to repent to your kids. Even if they're adults, even if they have kids, even if they have grandkids, if you didn't raise them in the instruction and training of the Lord, you might need to repent to them. Let them know what God has asked of you and that you didn't follow through and ask them to forgive you. It might be that God uses your repentance to draw them to him. We all fail to be the kind of parents that God wants us. We all fail to be the kind of kids that God wants us to be. So what hope is there for us if we're just a room full of failures? There's really good news. We are not accepted by God because of what we have done or what we have attempted to do. We are accepted by God because of what Jesus did for us. What Jesus did for us is the only thing that makes us right with God. And that should cause you to marvel. That should cause you to marvel at his grace. You don't deserve it. He offers it to you. And when you see what he's offered you, that will melt your heart so that it changes your desires so you want to obey him. Now, kids, your moms and dads need grace from you to follow Jesus. They're going to mess up. They're even going to sin against you. You need to give them grace. Parents, your kids need grace from you to follow Jesus. They're going to mess up. They're going to sin against you. You need to extend grace to them. We all need God's grace. Now, this morning as we close, our invitation is going to be different. Okay, usually we stand and sing a song. We're not going to do that today. If you're here and you want to talk with me about Jesus in your life, what he's doing in your life, or you're interested in following him, come find me after the service. If you're here and you want to talk about joining our church family, come find me after the service. But here's the invitation today. I want you to open your Bible back up. You probably just put it up, didn't you? Open it back up to Colossians 3 or Ephesians 6, either one of those. And I want you to look and say, God, what do I need to change today? Either in my relationship to my parents, regardless of how old you are, or in my relationship to my kids. 
And if you're here this morning and you don't have children, or maybe you don't have parents who are still alive, then my challenge for you is look around this room and choose one family in here that you can pray for. You can commit to, I'm going to just pray for that family this week. I'm going to get to know them and find ways that I can encourage those parents and those kids. All right, kids, are you ready to help me? All right, if y'all will come up. Let me invite all of our mothers to stand up, please. Okay, so here's, without running, I want you to take one and go find a mother and hand it to her and say thank you. Just take one. Just, even if it's not your mother. We need to make sure all the mothers get a flower. So go give them a flower and then come back and get another flower. Get one, take it, share it with somebody, and then come back and get another and take it and share it with somebody else. And moms just remain standing. No, just take one. Yeah, there's water in there. All right, we still got some moms over on this side that don't have anything. Go, we need some kids to take them over there. And there's some at the back. We got some moms at the back. We got some moms at the back over here. Keep going. Keep going. We got some moms right here. Keep going. Keep, you're doing a good job. We're going to get them all covered. We still got some back that way and here in the middle. Just get one. Barbara, do you have one yet? Have they made it back that far? So all the way back at the back. At the back there, and then Will, there's some over here in the back. Bryson, over here at the back. Okay, I'll take that one. You get another one. All right, did all of our moms get, get a flower today? Bobby, they're at the back. There you go. Okay, we got some coming. All right, kids, great job. You can, go, you can go back, you can go sit back down. Moms, if you'll just stay st standing, can I, can I pray for you? I'm going to pray for our moms after the chaos. All right, Bobby, go ahead and have a seat. All right, let's, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much today for the great idea you had to give us moms. I don't think you, any of us would have come up with a better idea for our families of having someone that is so committed, wholeheartedly committed to, to us as husbands, to our children. All of us in this room are here today because a mom sacrificed something to get us here. We thank you for how our moms point us to Jesus in the ways that they put the needs of others ahead of their own, in the ways that they often serve, look to serve first rather than to be served. God, I pray today that you would bless these women, that you would bless our moms. I pray that you would give them the strength they need whether it's the strength they need because of babies and toddlers or it's the strength they need because they're in the middle of hard decisions with older kids and teenagers. God, I pray that you would help them to not grow weary in doing good, the good works that you've called them to. We thank you for them today. I pray you would bless them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.
Parents, I'd encourage you to come up here and look at these resources.